Uh, so we have a guest. Yes. We have a guest. Adam Cockish. I'm sorry. It's Coquette. <laughs> it's I'm okay. Very I'm the one that peed on your couch. Yeah. Ah, yeah. uh, well. Mark in your territory. That's okay. Yeah. We all. I see you have freedom back there. Freedom. I do. Freedom! Thank you. Do you like Braveheart? <laughs> oh, well, I did. I did. Uh, un- until I-, I learned the truth about Mel Gibson. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Sorry, the, the, the whole, I, I mean, the, 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 the rabid Christianity, now I cannot, I cannot look at his face without seeing so much other disgusting imagery. That's yeah. true, you know? You look at him and you smell the crazy now. Mel yeah, Gibson crazy? Yeah. Oh. yeah. I'm scared. It's kind, of the same, it's kind of the same thing with Tom Cruise, you know? There's certain people. You don't know the history of psychiatry. I do. You can't. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to escape, like, you know, the, uh, that, like, whatever. I don't know. That typecast sort of image. Like, once, you're, once you get thought of as being, like, the crazy Scientologist Dude. guy or something. It's kind of like the Hollywood echo chamber. They kind of just surround themselves with people that just agree with them, so they think their crazy shit actually makes sense. Like, no one's ever actually criticizing them, and then when they actually they do get criticized, they're like, oh, why are you saying this? <laughs> <laughs> so what's on your mind today, Adam? Well, TJ, I, I know we want, to, uh, we want to DP the news and all, and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all up for that, although I guess technically it would be like, TP, I mean, does this does this make do we get is is this like a triple penetration thing that we got tonight? I mean, yes. Like if I if I really jump in and participate, and 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 do my fair share and, and you know carry my load, yeah. I'm, I'm, and I'm more than happy to do that. <laughs> um, but you know there there is something that that is kind of like a continuation that that's been bugging me a little bit from uh, from our, our last conversation, which was, which sure. was a little bit more of a throwdown. Now, and I, I don't but really bear in, to, bear in mind though, bear in mind, I do not remember that at all. No worries. So. No, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't require that for, for okay. anything, anything I'm about to say. Yeah, uh, I assume, that's assume good. That's good. In your audience at all times, you know, you know, <laughs> that's the way to go. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, no, but there, there was something you said about just now. Even you know, you smell the crazy. Like, and once someone is branded as is uh, so blatantly unscientific minded, you know, I, I've been an atheist, uh, you know, deliberately, conscientiously, as opposed to by accident. Um, since, you know, since I was like a young teenager, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't, you know, I've been looking for a better word for it. I think science minded, you know, yeah. is, is kind of, um, you know, it gets more to the heart of it than the conclusion. Atheism is just one conclusion of, of rational thinking, right? Right. I mean, well, you can go, you could identify as like a skeptic too. I mean, there's like yeah. different parameters. You could just say like, I'm a rationalist, or I'm a humanist, or I'm a skeptic. I mean, there's lots of different little labels you could slap on yourself. I try to avoid it too much. I mean, I think for me, the reason I like atheist as a term is because it doesn't come with some sort of, like, dogma attached to it already. It's just, right. he, you know, here, here's your position. It it's only defined by your position on one specific issue, you know? It, well, it, well, exactly. And see, to me, that's, that's part of the problem with it. It's like once, once you realize that, once you slay all the gods, you're like, mm-hmm. all right, well... Why do I need to be defined by what I'm not, you know? And, and, and I think there's something I'm looking for that's, like, more inclusive. Sure. Not inclusive in some bullshit PC sense, but, like, inclusive for me in terms of the way I engage with the world and, the, like, a label I want to put on me. And so, yeah, I mean, rationalist, all that. And a lot of, uh, you know, th- th- there was one point that we didn't really get to, which was that, you know, we, we as, as atheists often talk to religious people and say, Hey, you know, you've just you're you're already an atheist about hundreds of gods. You just have to get rid of that last one, crazy one that you think is the legitimate one, right? I mean, you've heard that, right? Kind of sure, sure, I've heard yeah. that. Old We've all chestnut heard chestnut of atheism. Yeah, and so one of the classics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So for for me as a libertarian, or you know, someone who believes in freedom, uh huh. To me, government is that last god. Right. And when you come to that, you know, I, I, I wish, I, you know, I don't, I don't know where you are in your thinking now since you since our last conversation, because that was a couple of years ago. But and, and I know you've always been a, a skeptic of government, but I think if you really fully, thoroughly apply your uh, your skepticism, your science mindedness to the mm-hmm. issues of government, I think you come out a lot more anarchist. You know, I feel like uh, on some level I mean, well, let's first go. Let's go for Let's talk about the differences between God and government for a second. I mean, 
we know that governments actually exist. That's one thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, good point. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if 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 a god was demonstrated to exist, I would say, oh well, let's see what this god has to say okay. well, and well, what sort I of. Should, I, I could differ with that, man, because government sure. is just a construct, just like God is. Right? Sure, it's a construct, but it's a construct. It's a construct of of a, of a an organization or an action. It'd be like saying, you know, this company's infrastructure doesn't really exist because it's just a concept. Well, it's a concept, but it's also in practice. Well, God's infrastructure is the church teaching. Right, exactly. And that's why it's important to be an atheist because we're combating the infrastructure of the church. Right. And so God, you know, so governments, the concept of government is something that society everybody buys into to a certain degree or at least everybody sure. who's not a libertarian, you know, buys into a certain degree and its manifestation is the bureaucracy of government is not, you know, it's not a sure. thing you can say you can point to and say that's government. It's, you know, all of these people acting calling themselves government. Right. But I would say that, you know, I mean, I, I think we agree. We could probably agree on all of the faults of the government or at least many of the faults of our current government or any government around the world. But I think that I view it more as a qualitative difference, whereas you're viewing it as a quantitative difference. And you say, oh, well, if we just subtract government, then all of these problems will be fixed. But I think that would just create a slew of, of new problems that are actually a, a lot more difficult to deal with, especially if you get rid of that centralized infrastructure that actually provides a framework for our society to function <laughs> well okay i i agree I, i'll agree with the, the first part of that that you do have consequences when you take away the system of violence that people are dependent sure. on you know and and one of the things that i've done well with we, book, you know i mean it, there's no there's no way to create a world without violence right but at least we can eliminate the institutionalized organized form that is known as government and this is a thing is i would challenge you to really well, define why, are, are are you sure that's a good idea to do though i mean because it seems to me that if we have a say a, a violent go a government that uses violence to control people in certain situations but it rarely uses that violence say like you know a country like i don't know uh norway or, or sweden um then wouldn't that be preferable to you know the chaos of true anarchy which you see in countries like Somalia or the destabilized regions of Iraq and Syria well again it's about defining the terms here because you say if you have a government that uses force occasionally force is the underpinning of governments to govern literally means to control by force sure so like you could say hey but i mean we we, we bo don't we both agree that there have to be rules I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of rules, and I'm sure that you're not either, but I mean, I think we both agree that they're necessary to actually... But you have to have someone that can enforce the rules, and that's all a government is. Well, actually, the government is an institution that is premised on its ability to break the rules, and the rules mm -hmm. are morality, the rules are ethics. So you can say, like, hey, we need institutions that do these things. Like, we need institutions for public safety, we need institutions for roads. You know, those are big collaborative efforts. Yes, absolutely. But can mm -hmm. we substitute nonviolent ones for violent ones? And that would be making government obsolete. Well, most, so you can say, most you people can, are so, not. So, uh, hold on, let me try to bridge the gap here. Okay, sure, sure. You say, we need these institutions. And I mm -hmm. say, yes. And you say, they'd be better if they were nonviolent. And I say, well, at the point that they become truly nonviolent and their only coercion is based on enforcement of natural rights, then they, they cease to be governed. And if you see the definition of government clearly as it is now, which is that which controls by force. Then mm -hmm. on the other side of that, you, what, what you would have, and maybe what you're describing as your, your your near perfect society, would be pretty close to that because most of the institutions that you're talking about would then fail to meet the definition of government. Well, I don't think so because I I do believe that sometimes coercion and force are necessary because I I don't think that you can just have everyone get along if the rules are always kind of this optional thing and there's no real body that's actually going to make you suffer any real life consequences if you break the the rules. But you think I mean, government doesn't can, function as the rules being sort of an arbitrary thing? Oh, well, sure. Thing? I mean, well, sometimes they do, but like I said that's a qualitative difference, not a quantitative one. Well, it, it, no, it's it's uh it's it's qualitative in the sense that it's what is the underpinning of the system? And like I would say, yeah, we do need as long as people are as as you know, as violent as they are today in the interpersonal exchanges. And, you know, we're living in the most peaceful times in human history, which, yeah, you know, is, yeah. is, is a, you know, statistically demonstrated fact now that we are progressing in this direction anyway. That With you can more centralized that. governments across the world, I would point out. 
Eh, well, there's also a move now for decentralization. I'd say we've hit the other. We've hit the high point of that. You know, we've got uh, separatist movements. You know, even throughout the United States, throughout Europe, some places. Well, there's. In, uh, there, that's uh, always been the case. Uh, all the, right, the fair level, I would. Fair I would yeah, say that's kind of a subjective analysis. Sure. Okay. So let's we'll move on from that point. <laughs> All right. What? Well, I, I I think if you I think if you get a little further into it, you'll see that like the difference between someone who who really approaches government, and I, I believe that you do in a, in a really rational, science-minded way that I admire. I think it's I think it's fucking awesome. I mean, I enjoy your rants, um, you know, because most of the time you you do come at it from the same sort of analytical perspective as I do. So yeah. you know, I think that that's uh, you just go a little further with it, you'll see that there's a lot more common ground and that there's a clear direction for how we can uh, we can start pushing society. Well, you know, I would say that on a very emotional level, I've always been um, anti-authoritarian. So, I mean, I would say yep. that uh, For probably sure. I'm an emotional anarchist, but there's just I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't really. I, I just can't bring myself to take it as a more centralized structure that actually provides a framework. I, I mean, I think that every government is flawed. I don't think you can even create an organization as large as a government without it being deeply flawed. But I think it's better than the alternative of just saying, well, you know, we'll leave people to their own devices and they'll self-organize in a way that's well, actually useful. Could it be that the fundamental flaw here is that they that, that governments are by definition, by taxation, that they're able to steal what they take for their income, that that sort of disconnects them from accountability? And then if you were to take away that particularly violent mechanism, then you could have perfect accountability of whatever central institutions th that society deems necessary for these functions. I mean, that's possible, but we don't really... I mean, I'm not... I'm obviously not going to be an expert in tax reform, and I don't really know how t uh, technology... Tax will, Well, I would say, I, you know, you're, you're always going to have to have... If you're going to have any form of government, it's going to have to have a way to make revenue so that it can actually... Yeah, it used to be tariffs. That's what they, that's what they did before income tax was tariffs. Right, so I mean, you know, we we could look at maybe the government getting its money some other way, but I I don't I've unless someone has a proposal, I just I don't see what the use in talking about it is. Well, we have yeah, I have I have a proposal. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's actually a process of localization of taking uh, governments apart from the top down, restoring the authority locally until all of the legitimate functions that government has taken on can be replaced by nonviolent solutions. I mean, one at a time. Can't you're still going to you're nonviolent solutions that are superior to the violent ones. You're, but you're still going to have to have something that can. The, the communities themselves are still going to have to be organized into some larger structure. You can't just have everyone, every little local community is its own state. I mean, it doesn't really work because they're going to have disparate values. You know, you can't really That's have the case a uniform. I mean, it, it, sure, it's the case, but there's still a centralized government that actually decides on policy for the entire country. Wouldn't it be better if policy were tailored to individual communities? Well, not really, because then as you travel across the United States, you're going to the laws are going to change based on, you know, what count county you're in. I mean, so can we travel internationally today? Yeah, I mean, sure we can, but I mean, if anything, we're talking, we're talking about big impediment to that. we're talking about travel within our own country, and sure. I mean, you know, to some extent, you want governments to to impede travel. I mean, you don't want people from certain regions actually just like I wouldn't want people from um, Iran or Saudi Arabia to just be able to spill into America at will. Well, <laughs> I have some bad news for you. <laughs> they kind of can. They have been. I mean, if, if, you know how easy it is to get across the southern border. You know how easy it is to get into Mexico. Well, a, a moment ago, a moment ago, you were talking yeah. about how difficult it was. So. Well, no, I mean, it's the like I'm thinking like the TSA is a big impediment. But if you're worried about like criminals being able to cross the borders, like for illegitimate purposes, those who have that incentive are already able to do it. Sure, I I agree with that. But I think it's good to have at least some measures in their way. Okay, well, let me let me let me ask you to think of a legitimate function of government. And then assume a couple of rules in this game that, one, you can't steal for taxation in order to solve this problem. You know, mm -hmm. you can only bring people together through nonviolence. How do you solve the problem? Is, and is mean, there any real problem that you can, you can imagine that you can articulate that way that you can't think of an answer? I mean, if we go back to the roads thing you were talking about earlier, I mean, like mm -hmm. our interstate highway system, under your proposed idea, you would have to get just people across 
hundreds or thousands of miles of where this highway yeah. is supposed to be built to agree that this is where it's going to be built, this is the land that's going to be allocated for it, and if even one person along the route says, oh, no, we don't want that here in this county, then you can't build. What's I think more it, complicated, the roads or the Internet? Well, I, I don't know. That's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see how people were able to come together and come up with common you know, standards and, and codes and things like that for the Internet and infrastructure was able to interface. But you can do the same thing with the roads, and, and you don't have to tax people because people are willing to pay for it. I mean, I would pay, I, you know, as just out of sense of obligation, out of you know, no, charity, but, I would pay but for when, my share to build roads in my community. But I would I'm saying pay my that share to connect when it comes nationally. But when it, comes to the, when it comes to the interstate highway system, when you're talking about multi-billion dollar projects and you're talking about hundreds or thousands of miles of land that's in the possession of, you know, who knows how many different parties, it's very difficult without some sort of eminent domain ability to say, here's where we're going to build this road. It would take a lot longer to actually get a road built. So rather than be patient enough to find a peaceful solution, you'll say, it's okay to force someone well, off their land I don't, if we want a road here, and we're going to trust government with that process? The people that make war? Like, really? I mean, I don't see... I mean, them making war is a totally separate matter from them building a road. No, but that you're going to turn to that institution, like the, 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 the people that have demonstrated that they're really not capable of achieving peaceful solutions, especially well, when there's property disputes. Last I checked, they're capable of building roads. We have a... <laughs> an interst we have a pretty well. And think you should appreciate this. We have people too. we have a huge interstate highway in system in this country. We've been stuck in this paradigm of the internal combustion engine, you know, spinning rubber wheels down a paved road for over a hundred years, or sure. yeah, about a hundred years now. And and it's only because government is heavily subsidizing that. You trust government to build an infrastructure. Now you're stuck in this. I mean, you know, the the idea that we have flying cars by now, like we really would, but the government subsidizes this transportation paradigm. It stifles innovation. I don't think so. I mean, some there's been plenty of people in government who are trying to build high-speed rail systems and prove public transportation. Um, and then there were other factions in the government that prevented that from happening. Yes. Exactly. And if you didn't have the government, those people without government would still be able well, to I, do no, that kind of no, no, no private, no, pri that. no private party has yet said, you know, we're going to foot the bill for the high-speed rail system. Because government has come in and subsidized it and poisoned the market. It's impossible to compete when government can steal for its money and then, you know, in the form of taxation and then say, you know, put you out of business if it feels like it. It doesn't create the environment where, where that's possible. It creates a disconnect from what people want. And instead, I mean, really, TJ, do you, you think the, the highway system in America is like all we're capable of in this country? I mean, if, if you look at it, you look at what roads in other countries and in certain places in terms of what people are capable of. It's pretty pathetic, and it's it's dangerous. Forty thousand Americans die every year on the roads here. Like it's, sure. it's like, that's not an endorsement to say that they're they're doing it well. But we're talking we're talking about figure out a way to do this without. Stealing. But we're t but we're talking about when the roads were first built and when that was the cutting edge of transportation. When they were actually built quite quickly. Sure. And they were the cutting edge. And I'm saying that you would have, if you had instituted, if there was no eminent domain, if there was no federal government to oversee a project of that magnitude, I don't think it could have been accomplished. So does that mean it should be accomplished then? I mean, if the only way to accomplish something is through violence, shouldn't, is, is that a sign like maybe, maybe well, we I, be doing it? Well, if the ends justify the means... Well, I thought you were more, uh, you know, consistent in your science-minded analysis of ethics. Well, I think that, you know, uh, if we're going to talk about you can never use coercion or force, then, you know, I don't think much can get accomplished. You know, people have to be able to cohere into a, a useful social arrangement. No, there's no, dude, by, there's by no, definition, violence reduces our capacity to cooperate. But I mean, but, the, but, here's, but here's the thing. I mean, how many times has violence really been utilized to, to build a road? I mean, it's not like it's the government. It's behind the entire thing, like you said, well, taxation it's, it's, and eminent domain. It's, in, it's an implied threat, perhaps, at the very best. I, that's enough, isn't it? I mean, when a mugger puts a gun to your head, he doesn't have to pull the trigger to get your wallet. I think there's a lot of qualitative differences between a mugger and a centralized government. 
Yeah, the mugger doesn't lie to you and say he's doing it for your own good. <laughs> well, I think that the government does do a lot of things for the good of the people. I mean, it, there's different programs. You can't, you know, and that's can't... their excuse to do lots of bad things. I mean, sure, they do do bad things. There's no denying that. But uh, I'm, I'm saying the mugger doesn't, you know, steal your money to build you a swimming pool in your backyard. He steals your money for himself. And, well, at least you know, when he's done, he leaves you alone. <laughs> he doesn't try to control you with regulation. He doesn't try to control well, you with drug war. Well, I, I, I like regulations. I don't want a giant corporation to just be able to spill toxic waste in the Mississippi River and, and you know, clap their hands together and say, well, whatever, that's someone else's problem now. The government justice system is exact. Excuse me, legal system is exactly what makes that possible. If you didn't have government, then that kind of co and, and and it was because like now, if you just eliminate government, that's not the answer. You have to eliminate government as a society because you 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 reject coercion, you reject violence, and in that case, then the, the pollution isn't isn't possible. You have a system where people are held accountable for that. Sure. I'd, I'd rather. I'd, I I feel the same way. And you look at government, holy crap, does it not work when it comes to dealing with pollution? In fact, it's the biggest polluter. Why? Because it doesn't have any accountability. Because it has, or excuse me, I should say, to be more precise, it has detachment through accountability, through taxation, and the corruption of the voting process. I, I don't think, the government is not the biggest polluter. The private sector are the biggest polluters. I mean... No, okay, as the single biggest entity polluter in the United States, it is well, the United States federal it's, government. But, but sure, but it's the single biggest entity. Well, all the corporations that are polluting are recognized corporations under the United States corporate structure and have special privileges that well, I mean, but... they're entitled to with that, that they're not in a free market. Uh, why would they not be in a free market? Because in a free market, there's a, by definition of it being a free market, there's respect for property rights. So when somebody pollutes and they damage land, they damage your health, they're held accountable for that. Well, how would you, but how would you hold them accountable? Well, the most important thing is that you have insurance, you have dispute resolution organizations, and you have a, a, a but without a court, but there, without without a court system, you can't. There's no, not there's no weight behind any lawsuit if you don't have that implied threat of hey, if you break the law, someone's gonna fuck your shit up, then you're gonna break the law. You're not gonna care. Actually, the better threat than than punishment because it really doesn't work in the system is ostracism, essentially. And if the society says, you know, this is this is a behavior that we won't tolerate, then you do actually end up with a private court system that decides, is this someone that, that we shouldn't be doing business with? Is this someone that really needs to be ostracized from society? And that's, you know, you're basically it, you're basically saying we should just leave this in up to the judgment of the people. But this is a population that, you know, irrationally thinks that gluten is bad for them. I mean, well, okay, this... hold on, TJ. Let me let me suggest a different way of looking at this. Right now, like you could you could say that we do have a free market, right? People vote. People people you know demand through the voting process through that. I mean, that... look, the free market thing is there's a false dichotomy where it's like, oh well, it's either free market or it's not. I mean, free market is a gradient. Uh, fair enough, but you have you do have the absolute ideal where you at least have no institutional incursions of violence on the free market on individuals who want to exchange value peacefully. Sure. So if if uh, you know you have a system where the market for violence is expressed as it is today through government, then you're going to be stuck in this violent system for everything else that you you turn to it for. But if the market says no, we don't demand violence. We don't support corporations that pollute. You know, we don't support politicians that that vote for violent policies. We we don't support the enforcement of unjust laws. Then, then that's the society I'm talking about, and it's it's not really a political process, and this is the big okay. But you're, but I mean, look, but you know, like the problem with this scenario is that it's populated by this dream populace of these civic-minded, responsible individuals that I've never met in real life. Uh, well, that's what they said about democracy, and if you really want to make that argument, you got to go the other way and say that your ideal form of government. Is I mean, look, hey, but you know, and that's cool. Look, the jury, the jury is still out in democracy. I mean, you're a you're a dissident of democracy at this point oh yeah absolutely no I, so, well, it, but no oh, look look let's let's let, let, let's shift gears here i want to i want to step in the process sure right okay let's talk about let's talk about you uh, your appearance right? i do let's talk about your appearance <laughs> on dr drew his show because that was uh that was how that was how we first mentioned the possibility of having you as a guest yeah he he cut your mic and then said it was because he was running out of time running out of time we can't hear what he has yeah. running out of time Sorry. we can't listen to this guy 
And, uh, you know, I thought it was very ironic that he's sitting there talking about, you know, the the troops are fighting for our freedom. And um, he went to 9-11. He, he went and to here you are. But I mean, here you are. You're you're <laughs> you're a veteran and you're trying to tell him your opinion. You're trying to exp- use the freedom that he says that you fought for. <laughs> Cut and his mic! Like, Cut his mic! Flag. Shut wave him up! Flag. Don't let him wave talk! The flag again! <laughs> wrong kind of troop! Wrong kind of troop! <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What was that? So I mean, I guess what was that experience like? What What did you? What were you feeling like when he cut the mic there? Because you had a very interesting expression on your face, like a very like oh like oh, like almost disappointed, I would say. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I I don't know if I should admit this, uh, but. I'm really an old fan of Dr. Drew's going back to the early love line days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, I, so, when I didn't uh, know what those strange bumps were, he really helped me out. So, uh, <laughs> uh, how much did Adam Carolla help you out? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not very so, much. <laughs> so, you know, I, know, I really, I, you know, I, lo- I love that show. I actually, I listened to it with my mom when I was in college. Too. <laughs> like when I was, when I was waiting to, well, waiting to go to college, um, when I was it just got through uh, boot camp with the Marines and everything, and like I really look up to the dude, and you know what? I I, I, I hate to use this term, like I sound like I'm repeating it, but the, the idea of being science minded is something that I've been homing in on a lot for myself lately. Mm-hmm. And I, I what I saw in Dr. Drew was someone that I respected as that, you know. And as he talks, like within the realm of personal you know, emotional, sexual advice, he's, he's great, you know, addiction specialist, cool. But as soon as it goes to politics and he's on headline news, it's like, nope, party line, whatever the authorities say. And, I, you know, and, and that was the disappointment that I had. Yeah, uh, we had him on, uh, or we, we played a clip of his. On Nancy Grace. On Nancy Grace, and we agreed with what he was saying there about, um, you know, marijuana legislation changing. But... After that, it, it kind of seems like when he when he's talking about politics, he just kind of, you know, it was a party. Yeah, line for yeah, sure. pretty much. Yeah. But I guess HLN just kind of has that going on. Usually, I would say. Well, it makes me wonder, too, about, you know, the idea of controlled opposition in media, because, you know, I, I thought about this with politicians. Like if you're the real money, pull, you know, you know, money behind the powers, the string pullers, you don't want. A politician who's going to be lying to people you want someone who believes his own bullshit and i think like the same thing is true about how people are selected for the media and it's just you know someone interviewed dr drew hey is he going to be a good match for headline news which was code for you know does he actually think about politics or is he going to defer to whatever our editorial staff says and you know and, and that's how we got he got put into the position you know and i still like i this is nothing personal against him you know i i I, I like him. I think he was he was a cool guy. He was nice to meet, you know, after the show. And honestly, like about cutting my mic, I really it, it kind of was that he was out of time. Like I don't mean to make an excuse for him, but it was more that he got flustered by being hit with something that like so directly challenged the core of his worldview that it was just like oh blah blah, blah blah I can't control the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Cut his mic, you know. And if he had just said Adam, we need to let, you know. Uh, the gun he finished, I would have been like, okay, cool. You know, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been like, I wasn't playing the asshole. Yeah, I gotcha. We just wanted to know if we could have a little more insight into that. 